Thanks. I do, Martin knows I love this conference. I really do feel, it sounds corny, but it does feel like this is my tribe. And I just love hanging out with uh, this group, and I know, fortunately, many of you. Um, Martin was saying he's been in this business 20 years, and I'm, you know, that's supposed to sound impressive. But um, I'm sort of going to admit to you that last month I celebrated uh, 35 years of working exclusively with tech product teams. So I don't know there's that many people in the room who can say that. If there are, I'd actually love to meet you in the break. But, um, uh, but actually, I, I'm going to uh, take advantage of that today. Because one of the things I've had is I've had a chance to work with a lot of pretty amazing product teams. Um, that's been my sort of unfair advantage, getting sort of access to so many amazing product teams. And I thought, I should use that. And um, so that's really where this comes from. And I'm pretty excited actually about this talk. I've never given it before because I'm going to take a very different approach. Because look, in truth, I've tried for years to write and coach and teach about the role of product. Uh, and you know, if you judge it objectively from all the confusion out there, I haven't been all that successful. It's, um, it's, um, it's confusing. I don't know how many of you remember or have read uh, if not, please read it tomorrow. Uh, ben Horowitz, years ago, actually about more than 20 years ago now, wrote a paper called Good Product Manager, Bad Product Manager. If you haven't read it, it is, honestly, I had it taped to my desk. And I worked with Ben. And I remember every month or so, I would force myself to read it and be very critical <laughs> of myself and what I needed to improve. I mean, it's. It's very short and sweet, and if you know Ben, that is very much Ben. It's very right to the point, very harsh. But um, made a, Ben made a big impact on me. That made a big impact on me. I had a lot of thoughts about product after I, I left eBay, and I actually decided to write a paper, which uh, was really, because that good product manager, bad product manager, didn't really say a lot about how to really do that job. It just says, good ones do this, bad ones do this. And so I, um, I wrote a paper called Behind Every Great Product. It was kind of my first debut into sort of the blogging scene as a product person. Uh, and it was pretty well received. It talked a lot about the role. But we are 10 years later. We're actually more than that, more than a decade later. And I'd like to revisit that, really revisit that. And there are three reasons that I want to revisit this topic. The first one is there's no question confusion remains. Uh, in a big way, all you have to do is read you know, any of the, the aggregation blogs that come around. You'll see all kinds of stuff. It, you know, it's amazing to me. A, a new product person must be so confused. Now, part of that, I mean, there's a lot of forces at play there. Part of it, I think, is honestly due to something I'm actually a big fan of, which is the move to Agile. But one of the consequences is countless product managers think their job is a product owner. And that is like right off the bat, that, that is screwing things up left and right. Second, um, look, it's the internet. You can't stop Donald Trump from writing whatever the heck he wants. You can't stop anybody from writing whatever they think about product. And so it just creates a lot of noise. It's really hard, I think, for people. So there's no question there's a lot of confusion. And I wanted to do, a, honestly, my best shot at trying to clean up this confusion once and for all. I think it's too important, as you'll see. Another big difference is since I wrote that, I have learned a lot, mostly because I've gained entr entrance to a lot more teams than I, than I had even before. Uh, and so I wanted to take advantage of that. Not just learned a lot, but I've also met a lot of great product people. You can, over time, you can start to really see the difference, the essence of what makes a great product person versus most. And the third reason, and, and this is contrary to some of the, what some people think, at least online, uh, I would argue that the role, one of the things that has really changed is the role is now even more important than it ever was. Even more important. And I hope to convince you of that. So, my, what really hasn't changed, though, is my belief is that behind every great product, there is always somebody, they don't always have the title product manager, but they usually do, but there's always somebody behind the scenes working like crazy 
to solve incredibly hard problems to make that product succeed, just always. And most of the time, we have no idea who that person is. We might know the founder that gets all the press, but we rarely know that product person. Because essentially there's three ways I see teams, uh, product managers working. Be real here. The first way is um, basically any time a decision comes up, they escalate it to the manager, to a CEO. So they don't make any decisions, they're just always going on. To me, I, I refer to this person as the backlog administrator. That's their job, they're taking care of the backlog. If you think the job of product manager is as taught in a certified Scrum product owner class, this is probably you, okay? Now don't get me wrong, product manager needs to also be the product owner, but that's like saying, I don't know, it's like saying I know how to use Microsoft Excel, so I'm a product manager. That's not, it's just one of the minor things actually that we do. All right, that's one way of working. The second way of working is instead of escalating everything to boss, you've seen this, the product manager decides whenever there's a decision, let's call a meeting. And they invite all the stakeholders, and you get a big room full of people, and you figure, let, let's them argue, hash it out. I call those people roadmap administrators. <laughs> that's basically what they're doing. This is basically designed by committee, you almost never get anything beyond mediocrity in that way of working, besides being completely demoralizing way of working. And then there's this third way, which is actually, I would argue, the product manager doing his or her job. And so what I really wanna do is talk about this third way. But I, you know, I'm not gonna do it like I usually do it, which is to kind of lecture about the the responsibilities and the traits, uh, behaviors of good product people. Instead, I am going to pick, I picked six products. Six products, by the way, intentionally that are iconic products. Every one of you in this beautiful room knows and loves these products. You probably love it, but you certainly know it. Every one of you. But I would also wager that probably none of you can name a single one of the, orig the original product managers or the core product managers but in their pivotal points. And, and that's, not, that's normal, but it's a shame. And it kind of bothers me, especially for this tribe. I was thinking, you know, if there, if there was a hall of fame for product managers, I'm gonna show you six absolute members. And I, not only do I want to introduce you to these six, but I want to show you, I want to share with you the backstory that, you know, this never gets talked about in the press. I want to share with you the backstory of really what made that product happen. So, um, and I'm hoping those six examples kind of show you a different way, a more maybe visceral way of understanding what the essence of this role is. So let me start by introducing you to Martina Luchenko. Um, and of course, one of the most successful products in history, Word. Um, the year was 1993. That's not actually when Word was invented, because of course, but uh, Martina, what happened in 93 is Microsoft was working on the biggest release ever of Word. It was actually 6.0 at the time. And the big thing about 6.0 is what's not, you remember back in the upgrade model, you kind of had to add a bunch more features to get people to pay the money to upgrade. Well, that's how it was. And this was the one that was gonna make them a ton of money. And also, they had a huge goal. Besides all these new features, they had a huge goal, which was, at this point, they were supporting three platforms, Windows, DOS, and the Mac. And those code bases had, had diverged. And so one of the things that was just driving the team nuts was it was uh, taking forever to get a release out because they believed they had to release simultaneously and um, you know, these are three completely different code bases. So big goal, honestly, the big goal of 6.0 wasn't the marketing pitch about all the features, it was we're gonna move to a common code base. And of course, 
because of that, not only is that hard, but it also put a lot of pressure to get that release out because they, they needed to get the, the velocity improvements that come from a common code base. There was a lot of pressure to get that thing out. And they did. They shipped it. It was Word 6.0, marketed as the most full-featured uh, version of Word for Windows and Mac. And on the Mac, it literally crawled. I'm not exaggerating here. It literally took two minutes to start up, OK? Uh, people, you know what happened, actually, on the boards, people started claiming that Microsoft was doing this to kill the Mac. So, no, literally. They thought this was their strategy to kill the Mac. And in fact, hate mail started coming all over to Microsoft, including directly to Bill Gates, with messages like, well, sorry, <laughs> they were complaining to Bill Gates. He started forwarding these messages onto the team, saying things like, this is depressing Microsoft stock price, fix it. And so you've got this young product manager out of Stanford, Martina, and they say, can you tackle this? And she's now responsible for Word for Mac. And uh, so the first thing they did is, the first thing they did is sort of figure out where they were. And where they were is they had just released a terrible product and they knew it. So they got to work. Um, they got to work and they looked, actually they, they realized, of course, that uh, having a common code base is great unless it results in a terrible product and that's an empty victory. More important, uh, Mac customers needed a Mac solution. They also really deeply realized at this point that people buy a platform because of what's different, not what's the same. Users didn't care that it worked the same way on Windows. They would have much rather had it work well on a Mac. So they got to work. They did, well, of course, they did a ton of performance work. They also worked on fonts because fonts are actually used a lot more on a Mac than they were on a PC. Um, they also worked on things like keyboard shortcuts so that Mac users were comfortable. Oh, they also, um, what else did they do? Uh, oh, one of the things the press was constantly doing is running word count because they actually use that as their benchmark for performance. So they not only made word count work reasonably, but they actually made it work better than it does on the PC. Anyway, they did all this work and about three months later, they released Word 6.1 for the Mac. Tellingly, everyone, they shipped a version of 6.1 to every registered user on a Mac, accompanied by a letter personally signed by Martina apologizing for the release. Okay, think about that. And not only did this work, of course, it was a it reset the perceptions and okay, it's a, it's a good product. Well, not only did it work, uh, and, but, and now, by the way, this is the first release the Mac team felt good about. Like they felt like they should have released this in the first place. But what's really remarkable is this caused Microsoft to do a 180 degree change on their strategy. They actually realized that they needed to not only diverge, but they needed to really build a business unit around the Mac. You know, the Mac community was, wasn't, I should have mentioned, you know, back then, a 6.0 release. The Mac version was like 60 million in revenue, and the Windows version was a billion in revenue. So it was pretty small. But they also, it's a vocal community. And you know, the other thing is, that community on the Mac didn't have a lot of love for Microsoft. So strategically, they made a big change, focused on uh, Mac as a business unit. And you know, it's almost impossible to talk, to really even estimate how big a difference this made to our world. Not only did this generate billions for Microsoft, look, even today, more than 20 years later, millions of people around the world consider Word and Office critical to doing their personal and business work on a Mac. And yeah, we all know, like you saw Martin's List, Apple's at the top. Would they be for sure if they didn't have the software that they needed? I'm not sure. Huge impact. That's impact. I mean, to me, there's a lot of points about that team, but to me, the strongest point is, you know, people talk about doing the right thing for the customer all the time, but it's lip service. Martina, knew what they had to do for the customer. 
And even though that changed major strategy, major technology approach, they did the right thing for the customer, and it really did change the course of both Microsoft and Apple's history. Martina actually went on, I first met her actually after that when she came to Netscape, she ran marketing for the Netscape browser. She was actually worked for Ben Horowitz, uh, running marketing at the first cloud computing company, and then she, uh, happy to say, she became my partner at SVPG for more than 10 years. She also teaches marketing at Berkeley. And the other thing about Martina, I will tell you, if you ever are lucky enough to have a marketing person that's great at product, your life is terrific. Uh, so, that's Martina. Let me tell you about another company. Honestly, one of my favorite companies in the world. I adore, well, I do adore Netflix uh, as a product, but I really adore the company. The culture, their product prowess is amazing. Love Netflix. But back in 1999, they were less than 20 people. And they were just about to go out of business. A lot of people don't know the interesting story for them. They were about to go to business. Their competitor was Blockbuster. And Blockbuster, you know, had video stores all over the place. And, uh, and they basically started out by having, uh, it was really just an online version of Blockbuster. You would rent the movie, it would be sent, shipped through the postal service to your house, and you'd watch the movie and put it back in the mail and it'd go back. They, uh, they got up to about 300,000 users, which basically is early adopters, which are always there, and there were some people in the US that lived in little towns that didn't actually have a video store. So okay, it's kind of useful for them. But they were stuck at 300,000 users, and worse, they weren't making money. It's, uh, it was a, uh, so they were kind of, they knew something had to change. They knew. Kate was the product manager, Kate Arnold, of this small team. And uh, while they knew they had to do something different, they weren't sure what, they were on a whole bunch of experiments. One of the things they tried was what if we were to change the model so that you could get a subscription for a month and then get all the movies you want. And it's an easy test to do. They did that test, no surprise. Great news was, yeah, actually, people said, I love that, a month, all I want, low price, let's do it. That was good, and a lot of people think that was the innovation. That wasn't the innovation. That was actually the easy part. Hard part is they just created a mess for themselves. They created some really hard product challenges because, no surprise, everybody wants to rent the new release movies. But in that world, in that business, uh, it costs way more for them to stock a new release movie than it is to stock a classic, right, an old movie. And if everybody's trying to, to rent uh, new movies, they, just, they basically go bankrupt really fast. So, all right, they said, okay, we have to do something. We have to figure out a way to make that business model work. This is actually where the technology-powered innovations came from. This is where they came up with the queuing system, the rating system, the recommendations engine, because they knew they needed to make customers love their movies, but end up at the end of a month with a mix of new stuff and older stuff. Now, that was, that's a hard product challenge. A lot of companies probably would have, wouldn't have done it. They figured that out. They got to work, they figured that out. Uh, and actually what was amazing to me is a few months later, they released with a whole redesign Netflix with the rating system, with the queue, with recommendations, with an all new billing system. Technically, that's not quite true. They, <laughs> this was pretty funny. They actually realized, um, they released that without a billing system because they realized they had a one month free trial which bought them an extra 30 days, <laughs> luckily. But of course, this is what powered Netflix for the next seven years, next seven years. And, uh, and of course then, to Netflix's credit, they, um, they disrupted themselves again by moving aggressively to the streaming model. But this is, to me, well, just think about this, by the way. During these months, as you're figuring out this new system, uh, Kate was saying that the stand-ups basically had almost everybody at the company. She's working with the founders. They had a now legendary co-founder, Reed Hastings, um, 
on the strategy. She's working with the customers, users, on validating product ideas. She's working with the analytics every day. She's working with the designers and the engineers to design and implement these capabilities, like the, the recommendation engine. She's working with marketing on this new acquisition model. She's working with finance on the new business model and billing. She's working on, with the warehouse on the whole fulfillment logistics issues. She's working with industry people because, by the way, while all this is going on, there's a backlash in Hollywood against this whole thing. Imagine her life. I mean, that is brutal. But it happens. Now, nobody knows Kate's name, but it happened. And I argue, yeah. And by the way, Kate credits some amazing engineers. She's a huge fan of, boy, Co-founders had a lot of courage and insight for that. But I argue Netflix doesn't happen without a Kate. This is a big deal. OK. Everybody knows AdWords. Everybody does. What you might not all know is that last year, I mean, AdWords actually was created in 2000. It's 16 years old. But last year alone, AdWords generated more than $50 billion in cash. So think about that for a second. And ask what you've done lately. <laughs> of course, it's amazing. Been an amazing success. So it's definitely a Hall of Fame kind of product. But again, nobody knows Jane. Most people have never heard the name. But Jane uh, was asked to be product manager for this new effort because, frankly, it couldn't get off the ground. It actually, the core idea behind AdWords had support from Larry Page, but there was huge resistance, legitimate huge resistance, from the two biggest constituencies at Google, engineering, why engineering resistance? Because they work like crazy, every, almost everybody there at the time working like crazy to pro provide relevant results. So advertising, that freaked a lot of people out. Remember the whole do no evil thing? That was thrown at her a lot. Um, and then the other huge resistance was sales. Because you know they were trying to make some money. And um, they had brought on Omid Kordestani, who uh, ran sales. And they were actually off to a, this part of what made it hard, they were off to a great start. Because they were selling keywords to big brands and showing them as uh, highlighted search results at the top of the results. By the way, just like Omid did at Netscape, where he came from, just like several other companies did. And they were starting to make some real money, because Google works well, so it makes it pretty appealing. So, and of course the salespeople were nervous legitimately about, well, we call this cannibalization. They're like, why do people, you know, why should we do that? We're, trying, we're selling this for big money up here. So, James asked to come in here. It's like amazing to me, this $50 billion product last year, how close it came to never being built. Very. In fact, most companies I know would not have built it. So, why? Well, so Jane had to, uh, Jane had to figure this out. So she sat down with everybody. She sat down with engineers and talked to them about what was the real issue there. And of course, they, she understood. Part of it was yeah, worried about relevance of results. Part of it is a lot of nervousness about advertising, looking at a lot of companies like Yahoo and others and not wanting to go there. Um, so, and they felt a lot of pride in their, uh, in their technology. Um, and so she worked with them to, uh, because then she also shared with them why this is important. Because most of them didn't understand why this is important. She made the case for the small business owner. There's no way they're going to get results, either through Omid's team, because they could never afford it, or even through SEO, because they're a little guy. They're never going to come up as high. And so she made the case for that. She made the case for self-service. Uh, and with sales, of course, they were worried about cannibalization, so she understood that. So she got to work, and the other thing she did really well is she, she went to one of the most respected engineers at early Google, George Hadik, and he went, she went to him and 
really showed what he wanted, she wanted to do and convinced him of its virtue, and he helped influence the other engineers. Uh, and the result was they, Jane actually wrote the first spec for AdWords. Uh, worked with the engineers and designers to build this out, and as you know, it's a pretty complex system. Uh, and of course, it was a radical success uh, once it got out there, and it really did change the world and certainly changed Google in a big way. Jane um, took a break after that to start a family, and now she's back at Google actually helping the YouTube team. Terrific, terrific product manager. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Alex Pressland. Alex, I got a soft spot for the BBC, admittedly, I, um, and not just because I'm here. I've had a chance to be in with the BBC for a long time, and um, I met a lot of really good product people at the BBC. Uh, you know, they've been around about 100 years, actually, and they were pretty early to technology. But um, Alex had just done a product for the BBC, which was, BBC was one of the first companies to do a, um, uh, s content syndication. They were one of the first to enable that. And she had just released that, and she realized the potential of this new technology. So she started looking around uh, England to see where this could be used. And uh, in general, the BBC could reach people through, uh, and by the way, this was four years before the iPhone, 2003. Yeah, 2003, four years before the iPhone. She started seeing, um, you know, people in their homes, in their cars, okay, they have radios or television, but there were lots of places people weren't being reached. One of the venues she noticed was city center venues. It basically had these big video screens, but she noticed they were just playing, they were just playing what's on TV. And so she realized, uh, it gave her an idea. So she proposed a series of experiments where she had an editorial team create, um, uh, custom content, and then she measured the audience reach and engagement of that. And, which of course sounds kind of basic, but the truth was this was a radical departure for the BBC because they were a broadcast culture. And this idea of content distribution was a very different thing. So actually, because these results went well, she proposed a new strategy to the BBC. By the way, she's an independent, uh, individual contributor. She does this. She proposes a strategy called BBC Out of Home on how to reach people when they're not at their TV or radio. Um, that strategy became the mobile strategy. But she, uh, um, she had some big obstacles. That is not an easy institution to change. Many of you know that personally. And um, she, two big areas, editorial, which was really used to Again, that they're used to creating content and in control of how it was going to be presented to the audience. And now they're talking, no, no, it's, you're going to just do the content, we're going to distribute it many different ways. This freaked out a lot of editors. And then, um, and she had to convince people it was not only uh, good for the BBC, it's really good for the audience, which is a big part of their mission. Uh, and she also ran into big obstacles from legal. Can you, legal, can you imagine all the license agreements having to be renegotiated because of all these IP devices? Anyway, uh, Alex pushed through all this and uh, it, it did become the mobile strategy. Today, more than 50 million people every week use the BBC mobile products. Um, Alex actually had a great career um, running product and tech team. She now runs product in New York City for Bauer Excel. To be honest, what, this was not just a story of technology-enabled solutions. It's also a story about force of will. If you know Alex, she's a force of nature. And this is what was necessary to make that happen. Let me tell you about Camille, Camille Hurst. Um, she was lucky enough to uh, sort of go through her formative years in product at Apple on the iTunes team. You know, in truth, Apple, when they first started iTunes, it wasn't a big success, but it was a, a necessary part of their strategy because, you know, the industry was not cooperative. And the, basically the way they got any kind of agreement was to do a DRM-based solution, which kind of made the industry okay, but users didn't like it. So, uh, but that wasn't actually when Camille got engaged. She got engaged when uh, 
iTunes really came into its own, which was when they moved to non-DRM. And Camille got to work on lots of efforts there. In fact, I had to work to figure out which was the most interesting to talk about. But one I loved, which was, you guys might have heard of this show, American Idol. Yeah? I think they might have had a, a knockoff of it here. No. <laughs> but um, Idol was a big thing back in 2008 when this was going on. This was a big thing in the US. 25 million people watched Idol twice a week with pretty much unheard of engagement numbers. And Apple's looking at this, you know, because when iTunes was trying to go mass market, there's product work, there's marketing work, and there's a lot of stuff that's a blend of product and marketing. But it's hard for any product to get mass market. And this was a tough one. And anyway, uh, Eddie Q, who ran iTunes, worked out a deal with the Idol producers. Uh, because it's kind of obvious, that is a pretty great target market for Apple iTunes, the Idol uh, crowd. Pretty great. And so they, um, they worked out a deal that let them uh, to do a bunch of integrations and really tie this in well. Um, the, the assignment for Camille was we want, uh, we want to target the idol persona, but we want to make iTunes part of the daily life of these idol fans. And uh, the problem was, uh, for ex I mean, there's, there's always, this, this kind of stuff is always hard, especially with a partner, especially in, in the media industry. Anyway, uh, an example was idol is all about voting, right? It's all about voting. And Unfortunately, uh, iTunes was all about uh, trending music. So if you think about it, that's like a predictive market. And so if they show the sales of contestants' song, who wants to turn in to see who's eliminated? Because <laughs> you can pretty much tell who's going to be eliminated. So they had to really change iTunes in significant ways so that it didn't disrupt uh, uh, and basically make the producers all unhappy and, and make that work and kind of come up with that compliment. And long story short, they did that. They, they came up with great solutions, led to a $20 billion business. Another great product manager. And to me, what was really impressive to me about Camille's work is <sighs> all the normal challenges, big companies, but they had to really be creative in coming up with solutions that worked for both Idle as a business and Apple as a business, and was loved by this new target market. All right, so far, all the people I've told you about, just to point out, they are all individual contributors. No directors, no VPs, these are individual contributors, product managers, doing what product is supposed to do. And in truth, most of the time, uh, if you've got a great product team with a great product manager, they can do th great things, especially in a startup, mid-sized company. But it's also fair to say in big companies, a lot of times you need more. And this is an example of that. Leah was, at this point in her career, a product leader. She was leading product for the creative suite at Adobe. Over several years, she had built this up to a $2 billion license revenue business, which is amazing. And by the way, that was roughly half of Adobe's $4 billion a year. So this is the big money-making part of Adobe. However, this was installed software. The Creative Suite was installed software, desktop software, on the upgrade model. And Leah knew that the upgrade model was pushing people into directions that weren't really good for Adobe customers and also weren't really good for Adobe because of that. And so she realized what we, they needed to do was move to basically software as a service, the cloud as a service. It actually became known as the Creative Cloud. But that's, realize this. This is $2 billion of a $4 billion revenue company. Every single bone and muscle in the Adobe corporate body is trying to protect that revenue. And changing a company from a license model to a recurring revenue model is wickedly hard. Changing anything, but this especially, just, I mean, we could talk for an hour just on the challenges there. Imagine how finance felt about moving, and they're a public company, and talking to the street about big changes that are coming and why. 
and how about, they, our engineers were freaking out because they were on an 18-month release cycle. And all of a sudden, they're being asked to move to continuous deployment, uh, and to, uh, they were also realizing, you know, the nice thing about installed software is if there's a big bug, the customer doesn't have to install it. That's not the way it is for our services today. And so they're like, well, we have to keep this running all the time, seven by 24. Um, so they were freaking out. And by the way, not if that's not enough, Adobe made their money through a go-to-market strategy of, of channels. You would buy it from other stores, including Amazons and everywhere else. So you could be, and that, so their model to sell was through a channel model. And this meant Adobe was gonna have to have a direct relationship with their customers, which on one side people are like, yeah, that's good. But like the salespeople, which not only their jobs were threatened, but they were also saying, you know, if we screw this up, the channels will probably not be very forgiving. So literally, they were betting their company. Uh, and so Leah knew, and by the way, it's even worse than that, because the creative suite, as the name implies, is not just one product. It's a suite of 15 major products, plus lots of utilities that all have to be deeply integrated. So Leah's in charge of this thing and has to convince the whole company, basically, to move to an entire different way of working, way of thinking, and way, a relationship with our, their customers. And so she, first thing she did, she teamed up with a CTO, uh, their then CTO, which was Kevin Lynch. They created some great prototypes that really showed the power of what they could do, supporting all these different devices and how it could be a much better world for the designers that depend on them. And they used that to kind of get support from executives, from teams. And then, to be honest, Leah started probably one of the most sustained, brutal campaigns I've ever seen. She had to constantly, for, well, she articulated the vision and the strategy to everybody, but she had to talk to executives constantly. Sales, marketing, finance, legal, engineering, design, everywhere to get them and keep them on board to get that thing out. And she did. They got this out. They went from a million users of, to, of the, uh, the creative suite, which was pretty awesome, to six million users of the creative cloud. They um, were the fastest company to a billion dollars in recurring revenue, which, by the way, is incredibly hard to do. They tripled the market cap of the company to, it's a $50 billion company now. But nobody knows Leah's name. But, of course, there were hundreds, probably thousands of people that really contributed to that, but I argue it needed a Leah. Okay. So there's five big things I'm hoping you take away from this. I wish I could talk about more. That was as much as I thought I could fit. The amazing thing is I actually know lots more stories like this. Great product people behind iconic products. But first, hopefully this, start, this makes clear, I genuinely hope that uh, product role is, the product manager is not to be confused with any other roles in the team. I'm hoping it's blatantly obvious why this has nothing to do with the product designer. We love designers. This is not the same role. And I hope we can stop having those ridiculous discussions about role conflict between design and product. Every time I've ever had that discussion, I'm talking with somebody that has no clue about product. I also hope we could stop having the ridiculous discussion about product versus project management. This is not a project management job. Now, the truth is, every product manager does some amount of project management, of course. If you think about it, every leader in the company, your VP of technology, your VP of uh, marketing, every leader has to do some project management, some cat herding and force and push things along. We all do. But to, con to think this job is essentially a project manager is to miss the point of this job. Now the truth is there is one role that this job is really similar to in very important ways, which is the CEO. Now, we used to talk a lot more about product being the CEO, uh, CEO of the product, but you know, it kind of went out of vogue because there's an obvious difference. Nobody's the boss. The product manager is not the boss of anyone. 
but the CEO kind of is the boss of anyone, everyone. <laughs> However, if you think about it, the good CEOs, they all know that they need teams of missionaries, not teams of mercenaries. And so the good CEOs, even though they are the boss, they still know they have to persuade the team. They don't want the team to build something just because they say so. They want them to build it because they believe. So that's the heart of this role. So it's not like the other disciplines. And this is what the CEOs need. Second, you can't do this job without a good, broad understanding of business. Like a CEO, you have to understand marketing, sales, legal, partnerships, manufacturing, all the different parts of the business in order to solve that problem. If you don't understand that, you're going to have to go back again to escalating all the decisions or meetings again. So you've got to understand all aspects of the business. By the way, that doesn't mean you need to be an MBA. As a matter of fact, none of the six product managers I just showed you have an MBA. I don't have an MBA. That doesn't mean if you have an MBA, you're not allowed to be a product person. It just means that's not what it's about. All right. And I know it's flashing at me, but just a couple more points. Um, I hope you notice that not one of those iconic products, not one of them, did the product actually come from users or from sales as in the cases almost all the time with amazing products, successful products, the product actually comes from an intense collaboration with design and engineering to solve real problems for our customers in ways that also work for our business. That's what it's about. It's about these technology-powered solutions. That's why product people have to be, they have to sort of wrap their arms around their whole part of their product and business. I hope you also notice that these people are, like a good CEO, by the way, they are the best, in the best sense, smart. Smart because they're like applying technologies to solve real problems. Creative, I hope you notice so many of them were thinking out of the product box, not just like, what feature do we add? They were actually looking at how can we solve this with the assets we have. And persistent, there's just no way. You know, in all those examples, especially like AdWords, a great example of why uh, a, a product that had many reasons not to get built. There are always many good reasons for a product not to get built. The successful products have somebody that get over each and every one of those objections, like Jane did, sitting down with engineers and salespeople. All right, and the last point is, I hope you notice, even though a product manager is generally an individual contributor, they're leaders in the best and most meaningful sense of the word. And the re I want to point out to you, that, and of course they're leading through their inspiration, through their motivation, through their logic. But what I want to point out to you is, is uh, if you want to be a great product manager, don't be afraid to lead. Okay, those are the five big takeaways. Actually, there's one other takeaway I'd love for you to yet, but I'll let you figure that out on your own. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.